أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajah. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I sincerely welcome you to our program this evening as we will walk through this very important journey of discovering what are some red flags and green flags when it comes to getting to know someone for marriage. And here from the stage, I see all these green and red flags. Reminds me of the camp of Imam Hussein alayhi salam with the green flags and the camp of Yazid with the red flags. But inshallah, we won't have any Yazid influence tonight. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, the marital journey is by far one of the most important journeys we will embark in our lives. The person that you will choose for marriage is one who will have the greatest influence on your life. That's why it's very important for us to choose well. To choose a spouse who's a good parent, who's loving, who's not selfish, who will take care of you, who will be there for you, who will always inspire you to be a better person. Finding such a spouse is one of the greatest gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you. So it's very important for us, my dear brothers and sisters, to choose well. That is why we have so many beautiful teachings in the religion of Islam that encourage us to choose wisely. This person that you will choose to be your lifelong partner, make sure that you put in a good amount of effort in choosing them. Don't take this lightly. Yes, don't be obsessive and have unrealistic expectations like some people, they fall on this extreme. I know some people for 10, 15 years, they reject every proposal, waiting for that ideal infallible to show up. We have to be realistic too. But it's very important for us to choose wisely. Choose the person that will help you and you will help them on this journey of life. Always see it that way. Put the emotions to the side and rationally analyze the qualities of the person that you're getting to know to. So now my dear brothers and sisters, we will start by examining a number of qualities a number of red flags or green flags. And I will ask you what you think about these qualities. If you think that this quality is a red flag, raise the red flags that you have. If you think that it is a green flag, raise the green flags. We'll have a discussion on that. Then we'll mention some very common red flags, some very common green flags, and we'll have a discussion on this. We will Seek your input as well. Based on your experience, what are some red flags and some green flags? So let's start with this first very important scenario. You're getting to know someone or you're doing research about someone. You have some interest in this person 
to be your potential spouse. Now let's say this person, and this is becoming more and more common these days, has had a relationship before. You come to discover that this person was trying to get to know someone before. It did not work out. This person got engaged. It did not work out. They never got married. Or this person is remarrying. When we have these discussions about marriage, they don't only apply to people who have not been married before. This is also applicable to people who want to remarry. And today, we have many people seeking to remarry. Divorce rates are very high. And so this is also applicable to your second marriage, if you're seeking a second marriage. So let's say this person has had previous relationships. Either you come to discover that or they tell you. Now as they bring up those relationships, you notice the following quality. The person talks about that other person they had the relationship with. Let's say they were engaged, it did not work out, they ended it. They talk about that person, they highlight their you know, negative qualities and they're trying to justify to you why they ended that relationship. Is this a red flag or a green flag? Okay, initially I saw a few hesitant green flags, <laughs> but then when most of you put up the red flags, the green flags went down. Okay, can someone tell us why this is a green flag? Look, the person wants to justify why they ended the relationship because they know you're concerned. I know that you had an engagement, things did not work out, I'd like to know why. So if that person is trying to justify it, one could argue this is a good thing. They're giving you insight into why it did not work out. And you deserve to know that. But all of you almost agreed that this is a red flag. So can someone tell us why this is a red flag? Yes, sister. Okay, so you're only hearing from one side, you're not hearing from the other side, and you're only hearing probably the negative. This is definitely a red flag. You honestly don't want to live with someone who criticizes others, puts the blame on others, or even exposes others, even, even if this person is right. Let's say the reason why the relationship ended is that the other person had problems. The other person created problems. He or she is not at fault. Even then, you don't want to live with someone who will easily criticize others for their mistakes and he's willingly sharing that with you. Because if this person does that to others, chances are, he will carry on these qualities and project them on you. Tomorrow when you live together, when you're married, you will make mistakes. You're not infallible. Chances are this person could go to, you, you know, your in-laws, to their family, to their friends, and they will probably criticize you. You don't want someone who criticizes the other side. So in a situation like that, even if you ask them, can you, you know, tell me why that relationship ended? See how fair and wise they are in their response. This is a very important flag. If you see them balanced, they try to protect the dignity of the other side. They don't put all the blame on the other side. And they tell you things did not work out. There were issues. But they protect the dignity of the other side. They're not so negative and critical. That's a green flag. But if you see them willing to open their bag and unleash all the criticisms that they have, this is a red flag. Any other thoughts about this? Yes, brother.
okay, that's a very great counter argument. I don't want to be left in the dark. I deserve to know what happened. So if you're not telling me what happened, why things did not work out, that could be a red flag for me. What do you say about that? That's a valid concern. So if someone brings this concern, how do you address that? On the one side, you want a person who's wise, who does not expose others, who does not put the blame on others. But at the same time, you don't want to be left in the dark. You'd like to know why things ended. Yes. How would you, how would you bring that balance? Okay, that's a very great suggestion. Let's summarize it in this way. So let's say you tell your potential spouse, I would really like to know why things ended. I don't want to be left in the dark because this is an important decision I'm about to make. Here's a wise way of handling it. And here's a wise way of speaking about the challenges in the previous relationship. If you want to highlight what happened don't mention specifics about that other person to expose them but here's what you can say you can say based on this relationship that I've had here's what I've learned these are the points that I have learned and now I'm better able to address them if the other side makes a mistake keep it more general this is how I would handle it so I've learned a lot from this relationship and I recognize people make mistakes even though people may have good intentions. Be general, be indirect with your approach, be wise with your approach. Use that experience as a learning moment. If you see someone who's handling it that way, I would tend to trust this person more. This person indicates that he's wise, she's wise. They're not stuck on the negative aspect, on the negative qualities of other people. They're willing to let go of that past and they'll tell you, here's what I've learned from this failed relationship. A person like that is one that you can trust. So this would be a green flag if this is how it's handled. But if you find that person openly talking about that previous relationship, criticizing that other person, even if that other person was wrong, I would take that as a red flag. We have to protect the dignity of other people. Any other thoughts about this first quality? This is a very important one. You hear it every day in the community. Yes, brother. Should you recommend to them to speak to the other side? I personally would not recommend that. Because once a relationship has ended, you don't want to go back and forth and send this person to speak to that person. Why did the you know, relationship fail? And then you might hear something disturbing or an accusation. And then you try to become defensive and clear yourself. It, it can you know, drag you into this muddy pool. And it's better for you to avoid that. I highly discourage that. I don't think it's a good idea to send anyone to the other person to speak to them. That would not be a wise move. So just be general as you can and tell them what you learned from this relationship. In doing so, you can hint to them what were some of the problems and why the relationship ended. Depersonalize it as much as you can. That is the key over here. So this is one very important flag, my dear brothers and sisters. You have to be sensitive about how this person views past relationships and how does this person describe them. Pay very close attention to that. 
This could indicate what kind of character, what kind of personality this person has. And it will give you a heads up. Tomorrow if we have a misunderstanding, how is this person going to react? Will they be wise understanding or no? Or no? They're waiting for me to slip so they can bring me down. Because we see this in a lot of marriages. So that's one flag. Let's move on to the second one. Consider this scenario. You're trying to get to know this person and you ask them why they want to get married. And let's say they give you this response. I want to get married so I can fulfill a personal void in my life. Is that a red flag or a green flag? Okay, overwhelmingly you're saying that this is a red flag. Why? The person's being honest. They're telling you, I have a void in my life and I'd like to fulfill that void. Why is that a red flag? Yes. Can you say that again? That's extremely key. The void is not fulfilled through marriage. If you have a void in your life, that void is not fulfilled through marriage. So how is that void then filled? That is an excellent observation. Today we find many people, they are seeking to get married, but in reality they're just trying to fill a personal void. It could be an emotional void, a psychological void, a social void that they have in their life. People have different types of voids in their lives. If you sense through your conversations with this person or through the research that you've done or just by observing their character that they want to get married to fulfill a personal void, generally that's a red flag because it indicates this person is being motivated by selfishness. What's in it for me? What will I get out of this marriage? Many people have this mentality by the way. When they think of marriage, they think of marriage as something that will benefit them. They're not thinking about the other side really. It's a selfish approach to marriage. And you don't want to marry someone who's selfish with the marital relationship. Because they're constantly concerned about what they want, what they need. And if they're not getting that personal void filled, they get frustrated. There are misunderstandings, there are problems in the marriage and they'll project that on you and they'll blame you. When they don't get the fulfillment they're looking for, they will blame you. That's natural human psychology. So you don't want someone who is getting married simply to fulfill a personal void. And you can pick that up. Ask this person, why are you getting married? What's your vision for the marital relationship? Through their responses you can gauge whether this person is seeking to get married just to fulfill a personal void. Okay, so that's the red flag. Give me the green flag right now. If a person should not get married just to fulfill a personal void, then why should you get married? What are you, what are you trying to achieve with marriage if it's not just to fulfill a personal void? Yes, brother. They can grow together. That's a beautiful way of simply explaining it. I want to get married to grow with my partner. It's teamwork. We're on this journey together and we'd like to build. Build a spiritual life together. Build a family together. Build a society together. Help each other spiritually and religiously. So as you're getting to know this person, try to find out if that's their real motive. Do they really want to grow together? Not that they're just fulfilling that void because that void will not be fulfilled through marriage. You have to have the capacity to fill your own voids. 
You have to work on your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with your family, with your community. You want someone who's able to fulfill their own voids, but they want to work with you as a team to have a productive life. Yes, brother. Can you say that again? Can you, and can you speak louder so we can hear the question or the observation? Okay, should you do istikhara on getting married or not? So, is that a green flag or a red flag? <laughs> very briefly, that would be a separate discussion, but very briefly, many scholars recommend do your research. Once you've done all your research, if you have a good indicator, things look green, have tawakkul on Allah, proceed. If things look negative, you see a lot of red flags, don't consider it. If you're stuck, for one reason or another, you're just so hesitant, you're not able to break that hesitation, then a number of scholars would say an istikhara would be appropriate for that. Okay, so going back to this very important point, we said that getting married just to fill a personal void is generally a red flag. So what's a green flag over here? Why should you get married? The brother said, so you can grow together. Any other suggestions? Why should you get married? Yes. You can raise children. You can create a good family that makes society healthy. And it's a way for you to contribute back to that society. My dear brothers and sisters, having goals that you write down for marriage is really helpful. You know why? Because the reality of life is that you will get into misunderstandings with your spouse. That's part of life. There will be problems. There will be challenges in the marriage. When you don't really know why you got married, it's easy for you just to end the marriage and give up on the project. But when you have goals that you've identified, they always solidify your marriage. They motivate you to overcome the challenges and make it work. How many of you here have worked in a company where you work on a team? Have you seen today bigger companies, more successful companies? They're shifting to teamwork. And sometimes you see these images of like a huge hall with all these cubicles and it looks like a hundred people are working with each other, right? These days you work on teams because teams are more powerful, more successful. Has it ever happened to you or let's say you know someone who works in a company and they work on a team where the manager of that team, the leader of that team tells you, look, I know there are people on the team who might be difficult to work with. People who are giving you headaches. People whom you think are putting obstacles in the way of your project, I know. But at the end of the day, I want you to make it work. And if you do, you'll get that raise, you'll get the new position. Who's experienced that at work? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Uh, the sister behind you, yes. So let's say someone on the team is being difficult. How do you handle that? Okay, now when you're working on that team and you really want to make it work, is it important who's right and who's wrong? Or is it important what works? What works, right? If you want to get stuck on who's right and who's wrong, your team will fail. When it comes to te teamwork, the leader of your team will tell you, look, I don't care what, who's right and who's wrong. I want you to make the team successful. Even if you think the other person is wrong and you're right, that's not going to change anything. Come up with creative ways to make it work. And good 
Team members and leaders are those who make it work. When you write down in your diary before you get married, your list of objectives and goals, write this down. This is teamwork. I have the following goals. I will make it work no matter what. Having that attitude, my dear brothers and sisters, is miraculous in a marriage. And then identify what those goals are. So one goal is, as, as the sister mentioned, we want to offer a good family for our community. We want to work on raising good children. That's a daily goal for you. Every day before you go to work, you have this as a goal. And you'll sacrifice for this goal. And you'll make this goal achievable and workable. Another incentive to have, I am getting married for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he commands me in the Quran and it is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You know why this is? Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. You know why this is important? Because in your marriage, when there are obstacles and things are becoming difficult, you always remember this commitment you made with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, yes, I know marriage has benefits for me, but I married for your sake. That's why some scholars, they think based on hadiths that marriage is an act of ibadah. It's an act of worship. It is indeed an act of worship. I got married for the sake of Allah and Allah is there. Even if I'm going through challenges, Allah is still there. He's still the object of my transaction. I still dedicated this marriage to my Lord. This will always give you the motivation to rise to higher levels, to make sure that the team is working. And even if your spouse does not appreciate what you do, Allah appreciates what you do. Before you get married, my dear brothers and sisters, dedicate your marriage to Allah. That does wonders spiritually to your marriage. So get a, a, a piece of pen and paper or use your notes on smartphones and list what the objectives are. I am getting married for these reasons. And always save those notes. Two years from now, five years from now, there's trouble in your marriage. Take out that note and read it. Tell yourself, this is why I got married. For these objectives, how can I make this team work? How can we get there? Don't lose focus from these objectives, my dear brothers and sisters. It's very important to list them. So this is the second flag. The third flag that I'd like to ask you about. You're getting to know this person and you realize that this person is very humorous. Excessively humorous. The guy's humorous, she's humorous. The person can make, can get the best laughs out of you through their jokes. Is that a red flag or a green flag? Okay. This one's a little bit tricky, right? We've got almost half and half. <laughs> I see some of you considering that a red flag. Some of you considering it a green flag. Those who say it's a red flag, why did you say it's a red flag? Yes, brother. We all like humor, right? Who doesn't? Excessively humorous. Okay, so why is that a problem? They're trying to just impress you. Okay, that's a very valid observation. Humor is great. In fact, believers are humorous. We have that in the hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. He was known to be humorous. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He was known to be humorous. Humor indicates a level of humbleness. You're flexible. You're humble, you're approachable, you're a good person inside. It could indicate that, definitely. However, if it's excessive and you see that the person's always trying to impress others, joking around. Remember last week, we talked about joking with the opposite gender. Honestly, that is a red flag. Because if you marry someone 
who's always humorous with other people or is excessively humorous, first, first of all, this person might not take anything seriously. And that will frustrate you. Sometimes in your life, you need that humor to de-stress. Some moments in your life, you want your partner, your spouse to understand this is a serious issue. Let's work on it. This is not the time for humor and joking. Some people, in every situation, they try to bring that in. And that sometimes will frustrate you because you'll think your partner is not sensitive to your pain and what you're going through. So if you see that this person is trying to just impress you, some people are naturally humorous. They're not trying to impress you. That's a good sign. But if they're just trying to impress you, take that as a red flag. If the person is easily joking with the opposite gender, take that as a red flag. We mentioned why this is problematic earlier in our program last week. I know this is something that when you read online, what do people want in a spouse? One of the top items is humor. I want someone who can make me, make me laugh, someone who's very humorous, someone who knows you know, some very good jokes. To an acceptable extent, that is a good quality. But if it's a little bit excessive, if the person is deliberately trying to impress you, take that as a red flag. It will create some trouble in your life, believe me. It will take your marriage to some bumps. And remember, you don't want someone who's just open with their humor to everyone because they will attract the opposite gender later in the marriage. I'll be very honest with you. And that sometimes will put a toll on your marriage. It could lead to relationships even after a person is married. So that could be a red flag if it's excessive. Yes. Okay, so let's say your spouse is using the humor just with you to make you feel better, to allow you to de-stress, to cope with the difficulties of life. Yes, we said that's a good sign. That's actually a green flag. You want someone who has some humor to deal with the difficulties of life. Sometimes when you're down and things are bad, appropriate natural humor does wonders. It changes your mood. It changes the entire atmosphere. So to that extent, it's actually something that you want to look for in a spouse. A spouse who's so rigid, there's no humor in them. You know, we're not judging a person like that. But it may be difficult to find that chemistry with this person, to connect with that person. So you want someone who's humble and humorous. That's extremely important. Okay, now an extension of this and I'll be very honest with you, just go on social media and see what people want. There are studies about this. An extension of this, this person is very flexible with their language. They cuss, they curse, and they use obscene language. Is that cool or not? Look, be honest. Okay, I see red flags here. But can I tell you what research shows? Research shows, scientific research, studies show that people who are like that, especially guys, they attract more attention from the opposite gender. How about that? This is based on studies. In our modern society, with our younger generation, this is actually considered cool. If you're always so appropriate with your words, you never use that word or this word, you're not cool. Am I wrong or not? You from the younger generation. What do your friends say? Haven't you heard this? That people, you know, who sometimes use obscene language, they're considered cool. They attract attention. Think back at high school or if you're still in high school, right? Right? That person who was so popular in class and attracted all the attention. Were they so polite with their words or not really? See? Our society today 
thinks such people are cool. And in fact, there are some people who claim these people are smarter than other people. If you use obscene language, you're smarter than others. If you know when to use them, right? So is this a red flag or a green flag? Okay. So if it's a red flag, I have one request from all of you. Stick to that, please. <laughs> because society tells you otherwise. Unfortunately, there is this culture where being loose with your language, where sometimes you use obscene words, that's considered cool. It's like a sign of your intelligence, your emotional intelligence, your social intelligence, you're confident, you're powerful, you have a strong personality. That's how society views it these days. But that is a red flag. We have many narrations about befriending people who use foul language all the time. Yes, now someone sometimes gets frustrated, you know, says it once a month. Okay, we're not infallible. Don't consider that as a red flag, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm going to remove you from my list. If the person has a habit of saying it, it's something that you pick up, you know, that the person is comfortable using those words. They don't get disturbed by using them. They're very comfortable using obscene words. Take that as a red flag. Even though this person might be funny, might be cool, might come off as being confident, but being comfortable with these words take a toll on your marriage because tomorrow these words will be flung at you in front of your kids and in front of your family and friends. Would you want that in your marriage? That's the reality. Don't be deceived by your emotions. No, I'm in love with this person. That person loves me. He'd never do that. Sure, when he's in love like that and they're trying to impress you, they're not going to do that. But once you enter real life and real marriage, those words will be flung at you. You want someone who's responsible with their words. They're not angels. They're not infallible. But they're responsible. Even if they slip, you feel them getting disturbed. They know it's not okay and they try not to do it again. I know some people like that. Sometimes they're frustrated, they're angry, something happens. They might say an inappropriate word. But I can tell they're disturbed. They know it's not okay. That's fine. That's not a red flag. We're humans. We slip. There are some people who are very comfortable saying these words. Extremely comfortable. It's part of their daily dictionary, part of their vocabulary. It's so regular on their tongue they have different forms and variations of that words and they're so creative with it. They'll use it as a noun and as a verb and as an imperative and as a preposition, as, a, as an object, every part of speech. And their friends, they're impressed by them. Wow, that's so cool. You're such an awesome person. That's the reality that we're living in our community these days, my dear brothers and sisters. Believe me, just, you know, participate in some sahras and some discussions and some you know youth moments that's the reality so as you're getting to know someone try to figure out when they're comfortable with their circle are they responsible with their words or no they're so comfortable using inappropriate words you want to know that that is an important flag to determine my dear brothers and sisters so as best as you can do your research Ask their friends, try to pick it up from them. Let them feel comfortable with you to see, you know, if they're very flexible with their words or not. If you see they're too flexible with their words, take that as a red flag. Today, many of the marital problems that we have, people who come for counseling, this is one sore spot in the marriage. Where one of the two spouses comes, they're completely shattered. The person says that my spouse every single day destroys my character. Hurls all these negative words at me and my family and they think it's okay. And when I tell them it's no big deal, I didn't do anything. And possibly the person doesn't even feel it. Sometimes they're not even deliberately doing it. But it's so common to them, they'll say it in front of everyone. It's, it's common, it's normal, it's part of my lifestyle. 
it's difficult to live with someone like that my dear brothers and sisters so that is a very important flag to consider any any thoughts about this based on your experiences and what your friends you know think what are their expectations these days or how can you better figure out if this person is responsible with their language or not yes brother <laughs> okay so let's say they use some benign substitutions so they don't say the word openly but they'll use a substitution okay what do you what do you say about that that's that's a good question how do you feel about that yes sister the intention is still there it's less severe right but the intention is still there yes okay that's that's a very good scenario here's my take on it the fact that the person used a substitute give them credit for that to an extent because it still indicates the person is somewhat considerate they still understand that these obscene words do a lot of damage and they're trying to avoid it so give them partial credit for that <laughs> let's just put it that way now if those substitutions are very frequent excessive I would consider that as a red flag if it's occasional infrequent you know I, I would not zoom in on it too much yes some other thoughts yes brother they're trying to fit in with society So a lot of people know this is uncalled for it is wrong but let's face it there's pressure on us to fit in with our society when you're in an ocean in a sea of people who are constantly using these words even at a professional level by the way these days you go to some companies the boss is using these words your colleagues at work they're easily using these words so there's pressure on you there's a lot of pressure on you okay just blend in just fit in be cool like them my dear brothers and sisters you don't really want to live with someone who's obsessed with social pressure who's always obsessed with trying to fit in you want someone strong who makes their own decisions now I'm not saying you know uh, that you have to now just not consider anyone for marriage because everyone to an extent is impacted by social pressure but just try to evaluate and gauge how impacted they are is it 10 percent okay acceptable 30 percent 50 percent or no you just have to kind of evaluate how much is this person struggling to try to fit in to try to blend in with with their surroundings with their environment a person who's constantly trying to get that validation from society is one who will create a lot of challenges for you in marriage so that's something that's very important to consider so examine the frequency why is this person using these words you know is it really just try to fit in or not to what extent these are all very important factors but in the end that is a red flag and by the way my dear brothers and sisters we have many hadiths that tell us foul language takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is one of the reasons why our dua is not answered one of the reasons why the dua of a person the supplication of a person is blocked is because of the words that they use because when you supplicate Allah sends angels to take your dua and raise it to the heavens symbolically to Allah but if this mouth is a mouth that constantly uses derogatory language obscene words the angels refuse to take your dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have hadiths about that so it's very important my dear brothers and sisters to train ourselves to avoid these types of negative environments and the words that we use have a negative impact 
You know, cuss words, obscene words, profane words, they generate negative energy. I invite you to study the research of the Japanese scientist, Dr. Masaru Emoto. Some of you may be familiar with it. We've discussed it before. I don't know if his research is peer-reviewed or not, but it's very interesting. You can see it, and basically on his website, he shows you the actual results of his research. So what he does is that he brings water in the lab, and he tries to figure out how the words that you use impact the crystals in the water. Because once you look at water at a microscopic level, you see crystals in the water, crystal formations. So he discovered that when you say a good word, like thank you, in any language by the way, not just Japanese or English, in any language, when you say a positive good word, how is the water impacted? You see the water forming beautiful, organized crystals. And he shows it. He shows images of it from his, from his microscope. And then he uses negative words, maybe obscene words, profane words. And he shows you the crystals are disorganized. They're in chaos. Now two-thirds of your body is water. Imagine if daily you're using these negative words, what you're doing to yourself. This even has a physical impact. We think these words are so benign, harmless, who cares? I'm just saying it for fun. Do you know what kind of energy you're generating? Life is all about energy. We have many types of energy surrounding us. Negative words attract shayateen and demons and they repel angels. That's one effect. Even if your intention is good. You don't really want to harm someone. You're just saying it. You know, to have a good time. Saying a negative word, the hadith teaches us, repels the angels. It removes positive energy from our, around you and it brings negative energy. You don't want that in your life. And you don't want to live with someone who's constantly bringing that negative energy. So this is the third flag. The fourth flag, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's see how you feel about this. This person is very firm. When they make a decision, when they study something and they're about to make a decision, you see them very firm in their decision. Is that a red flag or a green flag? That's a tricky one, right? I see red flags and possibly a bit more green flags. Okay, let's see why this is a green flag. You could say that this is a green flag because you want someone who's confident, who's firm in their decision. Someone who's always unsettled, undecided. It's tough to live with a person like that, right? They can't get their mind on anything and that's frustrating. So from that aspect, you do want some level of confidence. The person is confident. They're confident with their decisions. And they have a level of firmness. However, that firmness, once it becomes excessive, it turns into a negative flag. You want someone who even though they've done their research and they've made up their mind and they've come up with a decision, you want someone who's still willing to talk about it and still willing to reconsider. And try them, test them sometimes. Something that they're kind of firm about, give them a counter argument, be creative, think about it. If you see them, no, that's it. This is how I think about it and this is how it should be, that's a red flag. Because tomorrow this person will do the same in marriage. He'll come to his own conclusions. She'll arrive at her own conclusions and that's it. They're not willing to discuss it. It's my way or the highway. You want someone who's willing to reconsider. And look at the beauty of the religion of Islam. Is there someone in the history of humankind more confident than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Is there someone more confident than him with the truth? But in the Quran, Allah commands the Prophet that when you approach even the mushrikeen, tell them, let's talk. Maybe I'm, I'm right. Maybe I'm not right. Maybe. Maybe we're on the right path. Maybe we're on the wrong path. Let's consider a discussion. Even the Prophet who has no doubts about him being on the right path. But when it comes to having dialogue with others, he's very objective. 
He doesn't tell them, that's it, I'm on the right path, you're condemned, end of discussion. Why should we even talk? No, the Holy Quran is beautiful in this, in this verse, in which the Prophet even tells the pagans who are on the wrong path, let's talk, let's see who is on the right path, let's discover who's on the right path. And that's a beautiful quality from the Prophet You want someone who's willing to reconsider. They have principles. They maintain their ground. It's, like, it's not like this person easily compromises. But at least the person is willing to reconsider. They're willing to hear the other side. And you can see they're genuinely considering it. That is a person you can live with. But a person who's always set, and sometimes we get deceived, right? You think this person is so confident, mashallah, he's so firm in everything. No, sometimes that can actually be a, a sign of arrogance, a sign of stubbornness that this person is not willing to reconsider. So that is an important flag to consider. Yes, brother. When should we consider divorce? We're still in marriage, Habibi. Let's save the marriage through these flags. And inshallah, a divorce won't happen. <laughs> so this is a very important flag to consider, my dear brothers and sisters. Let's quickly go through some other very important flags. This flag is key, my dear brothers and sisters. When you're getting to know this person, try to see what their perspective is on religion. Do they see religion as confinement and restricting or liberating? That's very important. If you marry someone who sees religion as liberating, invigorating, motivating, Allah will bless you with a good life with this person. But if you live with someone who sees religion as restrictions, confinement, I'm suffocating with all these Islamic laws, that attitude that you see from some people, that's a red flag. Try to get the perspective of this potential spouse on religion. I'm not telling you this person has to be the most religious person and they don't skip Salat al-Layl, no. You know, there are important qualities, right? But this person has to be comfortable with their religion and they're proud of their religion. And they don't see religion as confining and restricting. They see religion as liberating. This person will introduce so much positive energy into your life. This is a very important flag to consider. Try to fill them out. What's their, what's their view on religion? Even if they're not so religious from the outside, right? Because religion is not just an appearance, even though appearance is very important. But religion is much more than that. Try to see what their perspective is on religion. That is extremely important. Yes, brother. Is it haram to marry someone who's not Muslim? Now scholars have mentioned that there is only an exception with the people of the book. A Muslim man, according to some scholars, may marry a woman who's from the people of the book, Christian or Jewish. But other non-Muslims, no, that is not allowed in the religion of Islam. So this is an important flag to consider, my dear brothers and sisters. Another flag, you're getting to know this person. Try to figure out how they interact with their parents and siblings. You're getting to know this guy. Try to see how does he talk to his sister? How does he talk to his mom? That's a very important indicator. Normally these days, that's not what Hollywood teaches us, right? Just fall in love and that's it. Follow your heart and chemistry and just go marry that person. Is there a Hollywood movie that tells you, look at how this person treats their sister, their mother, right? They don't care about that. But that's a very important indicator. You want to know how does this person function in the house? If you see this person genuinely shows respect to their mother, to their sister, go for it. But if you see this person is angelic with you, with mom, not really. With his sister, not really. Take that as a red flag. Even if this person seems to be the sweetest person on earth in your eyes, if you realize they don't genuinely show respect to their mother or sister, take that as a red flag. Because today this person is the sweetest person on earth with you. That may not be the case next year. 
That may not be the case when they live with you and they get comfortable with you. You want someone who genuinely, my dear brothers and sisters, genuinely has respect for their immediate family. If you see this person is really decent with parents, with siblings, go for it. I would take that as an excellent green flag. So try to do some research. Observe that person. Let's say when they're not really noticing and they're speaking to their mother. See how they speak to their mother, how they speak to their father. Their other siblings, older siblings, younger siblings. See what kind of a relationship they have at home with their immediate family. That is a very good indicator of how they will treat you when they get comfortable with you. So keep that in mind. That is a very important flag that I want to share with you. Yes. To view that? Okay, so number one, ask. Ask their friends. Ask family members. How is this person with their parents? Indirectly. Remember we talked previously about indirect ways to research about someone? This is a question that you need to ask as you're investigating. Or let's say you go to a, you know, a community member who's well connected with families and they'll tell you, I introduced this person. I think this person is good. Ask them. What do you know about their relationship with their parents? Have you seen them? Have you observed them? Or let's say you're visiting their house, right? Let's say you're taking two to three weeks to get to know them. You're visiting their house. Try to observe how they react with their parents, with their siblings. Try to act distracted. You know, you're not really observing them. And see how they talk with their parents. So either ask someone indirectly who knows that. Or try to pick that up yourself. If you genuinely see that they have that respect for their parents and, and siblings, go for it. That's, a, that's an excellent green flag. If you see no, you find something disturbing with the parents or siblings, I take a break. Indirectly, yes. Indirectly ask the parents and siblings as well. So let's say through a mutual friend or through someone who knows them, ask the parents. Ask the siblings, don't tell them that, you know, I want to get married. What do you think of, of your son or daughter? You know, which parents is going to tell you, yeah, no, don't. We have issues about that. You know, they're probably waiting to get rid of them. <laughs> they don't want to pass that opportunity. Just kidding. So indirectly ask. Just say, I want to know what kind of relationship they have at home. How does this person, you know, deal with you? What kind of words do they use? Do they show that genuine respect? Ask a friend who knows like the inside family structure. Indirectly have someone ask on your behalf. That would be a great indicator. Yes, brother. Excellent observation. Try to observe how they treat people whom not only they're comfortable with, but they feel they have a power structure where they feel more powerful. That's a very important indicator in marriage. So let's say this person manages a business. Try to see how does this person treat the employees. That's a very important indicator. If you want to know if a person is humble or arrogant, see how they treat the subordinates if you see them humane genuine with the subordinates go for it this person will be good to you if you see no this person has two worlds those who are equal to him or to her or those who are higher in power they're excellent they're very impressive but their subordinates no they try to step on them they demoralize them they don't show genuine respect for them. That's a red flag. And we have this in our hadith, subhanAllah. We have in our hadith that the true believer is the one who when he goes outside, he genuinely thinks between him and God that every person out there could be better than me. If you're a boss and you run a company or you're the owner of a store or a gas station, do you feel that you're better than your employees who work in that gas station? Normally you would, right? Let's face it, that's human nature. You feel you're, you're better than them. And why are you better than them? Just because you're their boss, because you're their manager, you have a higher position? You want someone 
whom honestly, when you go in that setting, you really can't tell who's the manager or not. Let's say they don't have that badge or don't read the badge. You honestly can't tell. They're so humble with the employees, you can't really tell like where the power structure is. That's a good person. And this is exactly how the Prophet and Amir al-Mu'mineen were. People would say when we would come them and we would not recognize them. We don't know them. You know, back then there weren't portraits or pictures. First time coming, the person would say, who's Rasulullah here? Where is the Prophet here? Who among you in this discussion is the Prophet? He genuinely would not know. Because the Prophet would not visibly show that. Through any stubborn, arrogant way. And we have, for instance, the descriptions of Imam Ali alayhi salam, in which his companions, like Dirar, he would describe him, Kana ka fina. He was one of us. You know how much meaning lies in this word, he was one of us. Study this statement in describing Amir al muminin He's the greatest creation of Allah after the Prophet. He was the Caliph. He ruled four years. He's the first of the Imams. His companion state, he was one of us. We had so much respect for him, but he's one of us. You want a person, when they're around their subordinates, you truly get that feeling where he's, he's kind of one of them. If you get that feeling, that is an excellent flag. One last flag, my dear brothers and sisters, here before we run out of time. Addictions. This person has an addiction. Drug addiction, alcohol addiction, game addiction, smoking addictions, you name it. How do you treat these addictions? Now we're not judging these people. People sometimes fall victims to different types of addictions. So let's break them down very briefly. If it's an alcoholic addiction, that is the biggest red flag you can think of. Not because I say that, because the Prophet says. The Prophet is very clear. Don't marry someone who drinks, who has the addiction to drink. Don't marry someone like that. In fact, the hadith states, if a father allows his daughter to marry someone who regularly drinks, فَقَدْ قَطِعَ رَحِمَهَا He has cut the rahim with her. And the second hadith states, a father who gives permission to his daughter to marry someone who drinks, every day 1,000 la'nas and curses come on him. These are not my words. These are the words of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. So if the addiction has to do with alcohol, with drinking, which is so okay in our society, that is a red flag. Okay. Let's say the person tells you, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to stop this addiction. Should you give them a chance? If you think you should give them a chance, raise your green flags. If you say don't give them a chance, raise your red flags. Okay, so we have more red flags. But wait a minute, Islam says give people a chance. So why can't you give them a chance? Don't people change? That's it? They're, they're stuck for life? Yes, sister, what would you say about that? They should stop for themselves, not for you. Therefore, my recommendation, if that's a situation you're dealing with, you need to give them at least a full year, if you're waiting, willing to wait that long. Give them a full year. If they genuinely break from that addiction and you can feel that they're doing it for themselves and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not just to impress you, okay. I believe that people can change. Islam tells us people can change. You know, if someone has some bad addictions, a bad past, it doesn't mean they're doomed for life. We have to be always hopeful and positive and optimistic and give them a chance. I would wait at least a year, not a month. You could impress someone and avoid an addiction for a month. It's not hard. A full year. If that person sticks to that, a full year, they avoided that addiction, and genuinely you can see they're happy, they're proud, they're honored, they feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that red flag we can say is gone. 
So look at other qualities if they're okay. I don't have objections to, to proceed. But if the person is struggling with the addiction, they're trying on and off, that's a red flag. What about drugs? So hadith we have about alcohol and getting drunk. What about drugs? Now the dangerous drugs, obviously we know the answer. What about a drug like marijuana? You're getting to know someone, you discovered they regularly do marijuana. And today, it's so common in our society, right? So many of our youth are doing marijuana. It's, it's normal. It's no longer something reprehensible and many states have legalized it. What do you do in a situation like that? And the person, let's say, has good qualities. They have a good character. You've done research. You know, pretty much all the personality traits look good. But the person has a marijuana addiction. How do you deal with that? Yes, brother. Okay, so the brother's saying, let's say someone stops from an addiction and they genuinely stop. Doesn't that affect your future children? My dear brothers and sisters, the Quran teaches us if a person genuinely repents, genuinely repents, Allah will transform the sins into good deeds. Illa, Surah Al-Furqan, verse 70. Memorize this verse. It's one of those powerful verses in the Quran that truly give you hope. Illa, Allah talks about some people who commit some major offenses. Illa, man taba wa amana. Except for the one. Allah says they're, you know, they will be punished, they will be doomed. Except, illa man taba, the one who sincerely repents. You genuinely see the belief in their heart. And you can see they're doing good deeds. They're genuinely doing them. Allah will change and transform and morph their sins into good deeds. Islam believes in giving people good you know, chances. Just make sure that they're not going through a phase. It's stable. They genuinely changed. If they genuinely changed for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I wouldn't have, you know, serious concerns about that. And sometimes you'll find such people, because of their courage to change their past, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate them even further. That's why in every year Muharram we talk about the story of Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, right? He lived his entire life, you know, not being close to the Ahlul Bayt. He blocked Imam Hussein alayhi salam and his family from going to Kufa. He was responsible for that mess that happened in Karbala. But on that day, he genuinely changed. And I'm willing to die because of this change. 14 centuries we praise him. That's a beautiful lesson for us. So if you feel that the person genuinely has changed, and it's not just a phase that they're going, and... This is really important. And the person is willing to cut off all ties with those friends who remind them of those addictions. It's not easy. Friends that you grew up with, you love them, you feel comfortable with them. If you really want to change, you need to avoid triggers and you're willing to sacrifice. A big trigger is associating with those friends. Don't fool yourself and say, no, I've changed. That's okay. I'll go to that gathering. They're going to do the bad stuff, the disturbing stuff. I'll sit on the side. Who are you fooling? Ahsant <laughs> Ammu. Thank you. Don't be gullible. Shaitan is not that easy to deal with. You have to cut those ties. You have to save yourself. I know it's sad to let your friends go. It's very sad. It's not easy. It's not an easy decision. But you have to. That's the only way that you guarantee that you will move away from those addictions. Any friend who reminds you of that addiction, who triggers something in your desires or in your psychology or in your you know, life to pull you towards that addiction, you need to cut them off. So if you're dealing with someone like that, tell them, prove it. Let's see. 
Avoid everything that reminds you of those triggers. Are you willing to do them? Will you cut ties with all those friends or no? If you see them genuinely do that, I, I would have hope in that. Yes, brother. Yes, it happens that sometimes later in life, a person can relapse into an addiction. That can happen. And that's one of the unfortunate, um, you know, consequences of an addiction. That is why I recommended you need a good amount of time to be sure that the person not only avoids the addiction, but they feel comfortable without the addiction. Because I'll tell you some cases that are frustrating and they ruin a marriage. The person stops the addiction. But they're frustrated. And they act like they're, they're doing the other side a favor. I hear this all the time. Yeah, but I cut that front because of you. And I avoided that because of you. That attitude, out the window. That's a red flag. If you feel that the person genuinely moved away from the addiction and they're happy they're at peace they're honored to be away from the addiction they're comfortable with their life normally normally such a person would not go back to the addiction but you have to be confident that they're there so don't proceed unless you're confident that this is the case now if god forbid some you know you did everything appropriately and in the future the person you know relapse into that addiction help them there are, there are still ways to help them if they handled it well the first time you know indications are they'll handle it well the second time so addictions are very tricky my dear brothers and sisters but they exist everywhere in our community they're very tricky to deal with but you need a time a year sometimes two years to be confident that this person moved away from that past this person cut all ties from that past and the person is happy some people cut ties from that past, but they're not happy inside. That person will go back to those addictions. Or the chances are that they'll go back are high. But if the person is happy, they're honored that Allah saved them from that addiction, usually that's a stable sign. So let's just wrap up this discussion with this last question that I asked you. Alcohol, we know the Islamic position. What about marijuana? A lot of people today do marijuana. Okay, let me be statistically honest with you. If all of you, <laughs> some of you are waving both flags. If all of you say that this is a red flag, I don't have very accurate statistics, but I'll tell you, you've already crossed out half of the community. So what do you do now? That means half of you won't get married. <laughs> <laughs> no no let's let's think about this this is an important one today a lot of people do marijuana a lot of college students do marijuana it's so common I'll tell you half of the Shabbat probably do it so if it's just an outright red flag that just means half of you will not get married but we know that's you know that's not realistic we got to do something about this right Yes, sister. Requires more depth to discuss it. It needs its own separate discussion, yes. They argue that it's not haram, right? One brother told me, Sayyid, when I do marijuana, I feel closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Allah is my witness, he said that to me. I honestly was dumbfounded. I just laughed. I didn't know what to say to him. So yes, I agree. There is that attitude. Maybe the one I shared with you is the, is the extreme one. But yes, there are many people who will justify it. Who says it's haram? I've done my research, it's halal. I've read the Quran and the hadith. There's nothing that says marijuana is haram. Yeah, you have that attitude. So my dear brothers and sisters, it is a problem. Here's the homework that I have for you tonight. And please take this seriously because remember, if you don't fix this problem, 
half of you here will not get married. And that's not something that we want. We want you all, inshallah, to have the opportunity to get married. So you have to fix the problem. Let's work as a team. We know that marijuana addiction is on the rise. A lot of people do it. Okay, let's not say 50%. Let's say 20, 30, 40, whatever. It's a significant population, portion of the population who are struggling with marijuana. What do we do about it? And how do we approach people who have addictions? This is something that requires homework. So inshallah, I invite you all tonight to follow up, make circles amongst yourselves, and see what you can do about this and how to treat it. Not every person who does marijuana is automatically a red flag. You still have different cases. There are severe addictions. There are persons who are just trying it. It's not that really important. They can do without it, right? You have different circumstances. So it's not like one answer for everyone. One size fits all. That's not the case. So I want you to research, how do you approach this situation? You're about to live with someone who's done some marijuana or they're addicted to marijuana. How can we address that? How can they break that addiction? And in what scenarios can I safely state, okay, you know, even if they've done it a few times, it's still safe to live with this person. And when is it a dangerous situation? Where no, I honestly can't live with that person. This requires a community effort, my dear brothers and sisters. Not just a simple answer that we, we, you know, speak about in a few minutes. So that's your homework. When it comes to red flags and green flags, one of the biggest challenges today is drugs, marijuana. Many people are struggling with this. And we want to have a healthy community. We want everyone to have the opportunity at a good marriage, inshallah. So we need to do something about it. Let's get together as a community and do something about it. And inshallah, later we can follow up. So there's no easy answer to that. I just wanted to raise it to your attention that we need to do something about it. Allah appreciates the effort that we all make in trying to address the situation. How to help people with addictions. Number two, if you're interested in someone and they seem to have an addiction, what do you do? We need good advice here, right? We need experts, right? We need to ask doctors, psychologists, community leaders, people who deal with youth, and scholars as well. What do we do? What's a red flag and what's not a red flag? That's something that requires a lot more effort. So inshallah, this is the homework that I would like to give for myself and for everyone tonight. My dear brothers and sisters, we're out of time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Thank you for participating in our discussion tonight. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin.